for you guys before we get into the sermon this morning. Uh, we're going to talk about, we have a weekend coming up that's super important. As we've been talking about getting rooted as a church and learning to reach wider and walk deeper as a church body, we have a very important weekend coming up for that topic. Uh, obviously, I'm alluding to Easter weekend, um, which we're really excited for. <laughs> That's the core of our faith, is what we are talking about um, during Easter Sunday, is the fact that Jesus Christ died and was resurrected, and without that, we're not here and none of it matters. So that's very important for us, not only just specifically for reaching wider and walking deeper, but for us as Christians, period, super important. So we're going to have breakfast Easter Sunday, we're going to have baptisms, we're going to have an Easter egg hunt. And uh, we're going to have the two services this year at the same time that we usually have them, so 9 and 10.30 a.m. So when we're talking about reaching wider, walking deeper, and being rooted, that also means going out into our community. And so on Easter, it's very important that we go out and we invite people to church, or rather prior to Easter, hopefully. And so it's very important for us to the, the person in the back of your mind right now that you're thinking about that, you, you know, you pass at the grocery store, et cetera, that you know you should have invited to church by now, this is the weekend to do that. So we want to definitely encourage you guys to go out and invite people to church. Like I've said, we've got lots of stuff for them to come enjoy, but um, most importantly, they need to hear the gospel. And this is the weekend for them to come hear it because, I mean, that's what we're focused on is the gospel message. So it's very important. And uh, as Christians, that should be something we're really excited to do, not something that is kind of a chore. That should be something that we're that we want to do joyfully, right? So, just keep that in mind as Easter Sunday is approaching. That we need to inv- be inviting people to church because this could be their first time their whole life, you know. And maybe you're the one that gets them to come to church. You have your invitations on your seats with all the information, so take those with you and hand them out to people. That either, you know, you, like I said, you know them, or, you know, maybe it's spontaneous. You're, you know, God talks to you, and there's somebody that you're thinking about, uh, or maybe it takes you by surprise. You just see somebody. So have that in mind as you go on the next few weeks before April 9th. Uh, let's pray, and then we'll invite Carlisle up to give a sermon. Uh, Lord, we thank you so much for giving us a, a place to gather um, unpersecuted. We thank you so much for giving us your son and sending him to die on the cross. And we thank you, Jesus, for being obedient to the cross. We pray that this morning you are giving people eyes to see and ears to hear the message, and your Holy Spirit is carrying the truth of the gospel to them so that they are able to be changed and their hearts are, you know, mended and molded more to be like you, and you're sanctifying us as we go. So please continue to do so, and bless Carlisle in this message as it goes out this morning. Amen. Thanks, Carson. I'm glad that you're here this morning. We are going through the book of Amos. We are in chapter 6 and 7, so you can get your Bibles out, get your phones out, get ready for us to read both of those chapters. Um, This series is a series about standing up for God and and standing out for God. And today we're going to look at doing that by being accountable to God and by being accountable to each other. So accountability is the big topic for today. Accountability is kind of a big topic in our culture these days. Um, Really not being accountable is kind of the big topic these days, demanding that people are accountable, that they're responsible for the things that they did and that they pay the price if they didn't do what they said they were going to do or if they did what they said they would do badly. We demand it. We bully people into accountability. So hopefully that's not what we'll get to today, but accountability is very trendy, very important. It's actually not a new trend. We have been into accountability for eons because a part of us as image bearers of God is that we want justice. We demand justice, at least in our lives. And when we don't get justice, there's something that just rises up. The hairs on the back of my neck, that's one of my things. Injustice, there's something that happened this week, and I was like, ah, I lost some sleep over it, but only a couple hours. I'm getting better at that. Broke out in a sweat while I lost sleep. But that the justice thing and the hairs on the back of our neck stand up, our hearts start beating fast. Our hearts get going. They get ired up. Is it just me? Injustice does that to us. Here's the thing. It's not just me. It's not just you. It's God. 
God is so into justice, God is so into righteousness that if he had hairs on the back of his neck, if he actually had a neck, God is spirit, then that would be what would happen. But his heart gets fired up. Why? Not because he's a law guy that's all about laws and you break my laws and you break my rules, break righteousness, I get upset. No, because it messes with you. Because unrighteousness, injustice, injustice messes with his children. It messes with you. That's why he gets fired up. It's not about the rules. It's about what it does to you. So that's the hope that we'll start to understand accountability today is not because God's a rule monger. It's because God's just, he's holy, he's righteous, and he loves you. So let's pray for that. Would you bow your heads? Close your eyes. God, we thank you that you are righteous and you call us to be righteous, you provide a way for us to be righteous. I heard a, a quote in a movie, uh, I think it was yesterday, that we have, as people, we have this uncanny ability to sabotage what's in our best interests. Unrighteousness, pursuing it is our uncanny ability to pursue what's in your best interest for us, God. Help us to pursue what's in your best interest, that we would understand righteousness is for our good not just for our rules. It's steeped in holiness and righteousness and love for us. It's in your name that we pray. Amen. So, during this series, we've been reading a lot about righteousness and unrighteousness and justice. It's been more than a month. We're almost done with our series. We have one more week. Uh, we're in six and seven, and I'm going to read it to you, uh, parts of it, break it out in a couple of different um, sections. But as I read it, I want you to be thinking about uh, justice and righteousness, but think about accountability or when people try to shun accountability as I read this to you. So here we go. Woe to those who are at ease in Zion and to those who feel secure on the mountain of Samaria, the notable men of the first of the nations to whom the house of Israel comes. What he's saying is woe to the people who are looked up to, who have their houses on the hills, are all comfortable in their life, they're all comfortable and cozy with the culture. Woe to them. Pass over to Kelna and see, and from there go to Hamas the Great, and then go down to Gath the, to the Philistines. Are you better than these kingdoms? Or is their territory greater than your territory? Go ahead and do what people do. Compare yourselves to those around you. Do the, the comparison game and look at the people around you. The lands that you've conquered that now are going to conquer you in the future. Get ready for that. Oh, you who put far away, put away the day of disaster and bring near the seat of violence. Woe to those who lie on beds of ivory and stretch themselves out on their couches, the comfortable life, and eat lambs from the flock and calves from the midst of the stall, who sing idle songs to the sound of the harp and like David invent for themselves instruments of music. You worship cheaply and insincerely from your heart. That's what we chatted about last week. Who drink wine in bowls and anoint themselves with the finest oils, live in the good life, but are not grieved over the ruin of Joseph, are not grieved over the people of Israel. Therefore, they shall now, now be the first who go into exile, and the revelry of those who stretch, them, stretch themselves out shall pass away. So your life up on the hill of carefree opulence it's going to end. It's about to end. Put your seatbelts on. The Lord God, which that's a claim of sovereignty, the Lord God has sworn by himself, declares the Lord, the God of hosts. Remember what that means? It's not angel singing choirs. Anytime you see the Lord of hosts, it's an angel army fighting for righteousness of God to be realized in your life. It's not choir songs. I abhor the, the pride of Jacob and hate his strongholds, and I will deliver up the city and all that's in it. And if ten men remain in one house, they shall die. And when one rel one's relatives, the one who anoints him for burial, shall take him up to bring the bones out of the house and shall say to him, Who is in the innermost parts of the house? Is there anyone still with you? He shall say, No. He shall say, Silence. We must not mention the name of the Lord, because God's justice to unrighteousness is so big you don't want to be a part of it. For behold, the Lord commands, and the great house shall be struck down in fragments, and the little house into bits. So those houses on the hills, the opulence, the comfort, the seeking culture, not seeking God, they're going to be destroyed and scattered like the bones of your relatives. A little bit stark. Do horses run on rocks? Does one plow there with oxen? 
So that's just um, holy sarcasm there. No, horses don't do that. That's not how plowing takes place, not with rocks. But have you turned justice? But you have turned justice into poison and the fruit of righteousness into wormwood, rotten wood. You who rejoice in Lodabar, who say, have we not by our own strength captured Carnium and ourselves? That's they're reveling in the land that they've conquered, the places that they feel like they have overcome. For behold, I will raise up against you a nation, O house of Israel, declares the Lord, the God of hosts, the angel army of righteousness. And they shall oppress you from Lebo Hamath and the brook of Arabah, those places that you've conquered. All right, so that's chapter six. I get, we got to pause because uh, now we're going to kick into kind of a different mode. We're kicking into visions that Amos saw, a couple of visions. Uh, the first two are going to be consequences to self-pride, to this opulent life on the hill stuff. And the third is about a measure of righteousness and accountability. So chapter 7, this is what the Lord God showed me. Behold, he was forming locusts when the latter growth was just beginning to sprout. That means that they had done one harvest. And they're getting ready for the second harvest. And behold, it was the latter growth after the king's mowings. When they had finished eating the grass of the land, I said, O oh Lord, God, please forgive. How can Jacob stand? He is so small. So we got to pause. What's happening here is Amos, you know, a lot of times um, prophets are like grumpy old men with beards saying, you're going to die, you're going to die. And he's been saying that, but he's having this moment saying, I love these people. They can't handle it. They can't handle your righteousness, God. Do you really have to do it this badly? He's sad over people around him that have given themselves to their culture. And actually, it says that, that God reconsiders a little bit. The Lord relented concerning this. It shall not be, said the Lord. All right, so now we have a, a second vision. This is what the Lord God showed me. Behold, the Lord God was calling for a judgment by fire, and it devoured the great deep and was eating up the land. Then I said, oh, Lord God, same thing. Please cease. How can Jacob stand? He is so small. I know they're living that opulent life. They think they're better than everything and they're not seeking righteousness. But God, oh, you really are going to do this to your people? The Lord relented again concerning this. This also shall not be, said the Lord God. So um, we're going to move on a little bit here. This is what I want to get to today, the part that we're coming up. So we, we've looked at self-confidence. We looked at arrogance, we looked at self-complacency and no accountability. We've seen coming consequences that when we pursue a life of unrighteousness, God will deal with it because unrighteousness is always dealt with. When we go with the flow of the culture, instead of standing up and standing out for God, we stand in and we stand down because of the convenience of the culture. That's where we've gotten to. But now I want to read this cool analogy. This is what he showed me. Behold, the Lord was standing beside a wall built with a plumb line with a plumb line in his hand. And the Lord said to me, Amos, what do you see? And I said, a plumb line. Uh, I have studied this. Otherwise, <laughs> he would have said to me, Carlisle, what do you see? And I'd go, um, a string with a rock on it? Something like that. Uh, Cameron and I were talking about that. That would be him and I, Cam and Carson would go, it's a plumb line. Don't you know what it is? So he knew what it was, a plumb line. Then the Lord said, behold, I am sitting a plumb line in the midst of my people. I will never again pass by them. See, here's the thing. Righteousness never can commingle with unrighteousness aside from Jesus. The only way we, we can commingle with God or righteousness is because of Jesus. Holy and unholy are like oil and water. They cannot be roommates. They cannot live together without Jesus. The high places of Isaac shall be made desolate and the sanctuaries of Israel shall be laid waste and I will rise against the house of Jeroboam with the sword. Okay. So, this is uh, where we got to. I want to talk a little bit about this plumb line. It's a great analogy. We're going to unpack it a little bit. It's, this is one of my favorite analogies in the Bible. It really is. It's a cool thing. So a plumb line is a construction implement. It's like a, a rock on a string, and you, they hold it up because gravity does its work, and it makes a straight wall straight. So before Carson came to work with us at Journey Church, he worked for an organization that sets up sound and um, audio systems for churches or big buildings. We were talking about the plumb line this week as we were preparing for Sunday and praying through it. And he was telling us about when he works for, these, um, for this company and they would go to large buildings and they would put panels up like acoustical panels. 
they would start to see how terrible the walls were, like, like rippled. I mean, they were just like rippled. They, they didn't use plumb lines for the, the sheetrock that they would put up there. But when they were putting those um, sound barriers things, that they could get away with it. But there's this other thing that he would do. He would make these gigantic LED screens. And those could not be varied at all, any fraction of an inch. Because LED screens, you know what I'm talking about? Gigantic television screens. Did you know that it's a whole bunch of small television screens? A bunch of them. You can't see that because they're all fit together so tightly, so precisely that you see one screen. And if it's off even by a fraction of an inch, it ruins the whole thing. That's how it is with God's righteousness. We need to have straight walls, any deviation from righteousness, because unrighteousness and righteousness cannot mingle together without Jesus. So I want to take the analogy one step further, so my, my teeny teaching analogy. For Israel, it was a little bit different because they didn't use sheetrock when they built their walls. They used rock, not sheets of rock, but rock. So if a plumb line, I'm only doing three, hopefully you can see it. If I line it all up, it would determine that it was straight. So let's just say that I'm building a wall and it's just a little bit off. And then this one's a, a little bit off. And as I build the wall, it's a little bit off and a little bit. Do you see what starts to happen to the wall? It's a crooked wall. What's so bad about a crooked wall? Crooked walls fall down. It's a danger thing that's actually dangerous. Unrighteousness is dangerous to us too because those walls will fall down and when those walls fall down, they damage people. So the risk of building crooked walls is not just aesthetics. It's not that we can live with the ripple in the walls. It kills things. It's, it's unrighteousness. Building crooked walls in our lives is dangerous. It damages us. It damages people around us. It kills relationships. We say it a lot at Journey. Sin kills things. It breaks trust. It traumatizes people when walls fall down. You build a wall for your family and something happens that you've built a crooked wall and it falls down and it traumatizes people. You know what I was thinking about this trauma thing? Do you ever... Picture God being traumatized about unrighteousness in your life. He is. Why do you think Amos keeps barking about unrighteousness? Because God's traumatized over you because of what unrighteousness does to your life. So I have a few questions for you. Are you building crooked walls in your life? You know, just a little bit, just a little off here, a little off there. And so you build the crooked wall. And what's it doing to your life? Fudging just a little bit. I have a list for you. Maybe you're on this list. I'm not looking at porn. I'm just looking at suggestive reels and clips on my, on my phone. Badly placed bricks. That's all there is to that. I'm not gossiping, which I remind you, there's more recommendations about not gossiping because of the damage it does than almost any other sin in the Bible. I'm not gossiping. I'm just detoxing badly placed bricks, my friends. I'm only crass talking with close friends. I know I'm disrespecting people, maybe underlying, undermining leaders, but it's just with close friends, badly placed bricks. I'm only cheating on my taxes a little bit. I mean, the government has enough money, and they're not a good steward of the money that they do have. Badly placed brick. I'm only letting my elementary age kids make some decisions about their identity that God already gave them. Badly placed bricks. So I don't know what's on your list, but I bet you've made some crooked walls. I bet you put some bricks just a little bit off and just a little bit off brick by brick. You've built a crooked wall I know that I have in my life. So Amos' vision is a plea for us not just Israel, to build straight walls. Quit building crooked walls. That's the call. See, God will apply the plumb line to your life. He will. He will. He'll see, you'll see in the presence of Jesus that your wall was crooked, but in the presence of Jesus, he'll make the wall straight because that's what Jesus does. All right, we're going to move on. Um, so what's going to happen now, it's the only place in Amos where we start to see a story rather than 
the, the barkings of a prophet who's concerned for his people. So it's kind of changing form because there's this uh, encounter, this story that starts to happen. And then Amaziah, the priest of Bethel, sent to Jeroboam, king of Israel, saying, Amos has conspired against you in the midst of the house of Israel. The land is not able to bear his words. Yeah, Amos knew that already. For thus Amos had said, Jeroboam shall die by the sword, and Israel must go into exile away from his land. And Amaziah said to Amos, O seer, go, flee away to the land of Judah, where you came from, and eat bread there and prophesy there, but never again prophesy at Bethel. For it is the king's sanctuary, and it's the temple of the kingdom. We're all good here, Amos. Take your barking and bark at your own people. Remember that he's talking to Israel, and he's from Judah. The kingdom is separated at this time, and he came from the southern region, and he's barking at the people in the northern region. And the priest, Amaziah, of the northern country, says, go back to your people. Away with you. We are tired of your doomsday message. We just don't want to hear it anymore, which, by the way, is a typical response when we're called out on our own stuff. You don't know what you're talking about. Go, uh, thanks for sharing, but feel free to be selfish. That's the tendency I can have. Thanks for sharing, but mm, be selfish next time. Then Amos answered and said to Amaziah, I was no prophet, nor prophet's son, but I was a herdsman and a dresser of sycamore figs. But the Lord took me from following the flock. And the Lord said to me, go prophesy to my people Israel. Now therefore hear the word of God. It's like, dude, you think I want to be barking at you? My life was good. I kind of had a house on the hill too, but God called me out of that and he called me to come and care about you and care about righteousness for you. And this is how you're going to talk to me. You say, do not prophesy against Israel. Do not preach against the house of Isaac. Therefore, thus says the Lord, your wife shall be a prostitute in the city, and your sons and your daughters shall fall, fall by the sword, and your land shall be divided up with a measuring line. You yourself shall die in an unclean land, and Israel shall surely go into exile from its land. So he says, um, you are building a crooked wall. Your crooked wall will fall down for your country, for your nation. Your crooked wall will fall down for you as a man. Your crooked wall will fall down for you as a priest in your job. Your crooked wall will fall down for you even in your marriage. And all indications are exactly that that happened. So we have the Assyrians that came in. They took the northern country of Israel and they took all the important people, the people on the hill, the opulent people on the hill of which Amaziah was one, so was King Jeroboam was one, and they took them away from their land and dispersed them all over the place. Not in any distinct place, just dispersed them all over the place. The people of importance they took, the people of non-importance, they just let them fend for themselves like Amaziah's wife. So I was looking up to see if, if that's what happened to her. We don't know for sure if that's what happened. It probably did. She had to figure out how to survive because he was taken away and she was probably left behind. Honestly, if that, as that happened, I was thinking about it. I don't, they probably shouldn't have been too upset because this was the lifestyle they liked. They were called to stand up and stand out for God and they stood in and did not stand up but sat down and became influenced by the culture around them rather than the people of God that were called to be an influence on the culture around them. So big deal. They were with the people they wanted to be with. That's how I look at it. They built their own crooked wall and it fell on them and they built the crooked wall. They had to live with it. So I think that that's just like us. You know, when we see these stories in the Old Testament, we like to say, oh, silly Israel. Oh, you're so silly if you just come back to God. But the mirror should be at us because we're tempted to build crooked walls ourselves with the way that we see God, with the religion of our time, the religion of self, the culture of our time, the social constructs, the crooked walls that society builds for us. We build crooked walls not just in our houses and not just in our private lives, but in our community. So here's what I want us to get to. The people of God stand up and stand out, not just stand down and stand in. When we stand up for God and for righteousness, that's what we're doing for not just us, but for our community, for our people around us. Because the line is, sin kills things. It's killing you, and it's killing people in our community. So we don't stand down to changing standards that our society puts on us, where I, I think it's just a cesspool of unrighteousness. It is. It's just a cesspool. We don't stand up with culture 
And when they say, this is what's okay to do, and we go, okay, all right. We don't stand up. We stand in and say, yeah, what's well, not okay, I guess it's okay. No. People of God stand up for righteousness. So that's where we want to get to, and we want to do it with love. So we have a couple of applications. You know, the, the big thing about Amos is we see Amos as the, a barking prophet, is he loves Israel. And as we look at righteousness in our life, the big thing is, is we're a rooted church, rooting ourselves to give ourselves to our community because we're contributors and not consumers. We need to do these things with love. So here's some application points. Build straight walls for our community and not just for you. Because crooked walls fall down, not just on us. The crooked walls are falling down all around us. So the way we can do that is by knowing God's standards. Know God. Seek him out. That's what we talked about last week in chapter 5. Seek God out. It said, seek me and live. Not seek me and die. Seek me and live. So know God by knowing your Bible. The Bible is a pretty good plumb line for us. And like Amos, when we become aware of our crooked walls in our community, have love for our community, not just condemnation. Love for our community. Speak truth with love. Speak truth, crooked walls, crooked walls, but I love you. So we want to help you with this. We're pretty excited about a series that's coming up. Uh, we have uh, Easter and then the week after, I'm going to talk to you about the point of a pastor. Why do we have pastors? Then we're going to start a new series called Woke or Awake. It's kind of a cool thing. It's a teeny bit controversial, but I think you can handle it. We're going to talk about the church has been awake since Jesus established it. The church is already awake. All great, impacting social movements, medicinal movements, intellectual movements, artistic movements. You know how they got started? By people like us, the church. The church has always been awake. It's been ignited by people like us that were aligned with Jesus and cared about the community that he died for. The church is awake. So those, that series is going to talk about the standard of God and a culture trying to change the standard. And you might think that uh, we can live with it. We shouldn't just live with it. So we're going to compassionately learn how to respond to a world that has crooked walls and how the subtleness of being awake is really um, already established by God. So it's going to be fun. Uh, tell people about it. It's going to be informative and educational, and we do this with compassion, not with condemnation. Next thing. There is a standard of accountability. Hopefully, you've heard that this morning. It's righteousness. Righteousness builds straight walls that won't fall down. So you need to do you with someone besides you. You get that? You need to do you with someone besides you. I've told you how much I hate that you do you thing. I think that that mantra for life is like a beckoning from hell itself. I really do. Because we know when we give ourselves to ourselves, we end up with crooked walls. In Jeremiah 17, 9, it says, The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick. Who can understand it? We, uh, or we go into Romans chapter 7. I don't do what I do want to do. I do do what I don't want to do. Left to ourselves, we're our, to our own devices, we're our own worst device. Personal isolation leads to personal desolation. So when it comes to accountability, most of us are like Amaziah. When we're called out on our stuff, we're going, yeah, but you need to know the whole story. No, it's a crooked wall. It's just a crooked wall. Let's put some straight bricks on it, but it's just a crooked wall. And then we say, when you do you, I'll, I'll build my crooked wall. You build your crooked wall. We'll just all have a bunch of crooked walls. And when it falls down on you, um, you just keep doing you. Good luck with that. And when it falls on me, I'll just keep doing me. Or actually what happens so much and too much is that when our crooked walls, the ones that we built, fall on us, we blame each other or someone else or something else rather than the ones who actually put the bricks on your wall, which is you. I'm going to tell you a story about accountability. There's a friend of mine who built a crooked wall, super crooked. And man, did it fall down. He was actually an accountability partner quotation marks. We met every week for years. He was a pastor, a fellow pastor. We actually met in a coffee shop. 
uh, we would just be studying and eventually we started talking and one thing led to another and we became friends and accountability partners. Every week we talked about church, the struggles of a pastor. We talked about masculinity. We talked about marriage. We talked about God. We talked about the Bible. We talked about sex. We talked about everything or so I thought. He was accountable to what he wanted me to know about because he was building a crooked wall. One day he showed up to our lunch appointment and he met me in the parking lot and he said, I can't meet today because I have an appointment. I, ha I can't miss. I got into some trouble, he said. So he told me the trouble. He had started to get in, entrenched in the underbelly of the internet. This was 15 or more mm -hmm. years ago. And into the, the pornography of the internet. And he started to form illicit relationships with people he only knew on the internet. And this pastor, who was accountable to me, married to a wonderful woman of God, was sending pictures, you know what kind of pictures, to women that he had relationships with online. One of those women turned out to be a girl, a minor, and he got busted. See, when it comes to accountability, we're only accountable for certain things. What we share, what we're open to, if we share about the crooked wall. And my friend started to pay a very high price for the crooked wall that he had built. I remember the day that it was on the news, a mugshot of one of my best friends on the news in Phoenix. If you were here, you would have seen it. He went to jail. But we stayed together as friends. We stayed together as accountability partners. We, I met with them and some other guys. We did Bible studies at his house. You know why we did his house? Because he had an ankle bracelet on. He couldn't leave his house. He was a convicted child molester because of what he had done. The crooked wall. He went to jail. I visited him there too. He got out of jail. He went to rehab from the state. It was faithful to it. He was rebuilding a, a straight wall. He went in to um, uh, get his probation revoked, and he, got, he was successful in that. See, I'm not telling you that I was with him because I'm something. Accountability, building straight walls, is something we do together, especially when we repent about it. We get to build straight walls with each other. He had other friends. He had his wife. He had Jesus, has Jesus, and he rebuilt his life one straight brick at a time. The crooked wall tumbled down, but the straight wall got built. He has straighter walls. And you know what else? Uh, I had coffee with him two days ago. His wall is still straight. We hadn't seen each other in three or four years. He still has a straight wall by the grace of Jesus and the grace of other accountability partners. So here's the thing I want to challenge you about. The problem with secret sins or bricks that build crooked walls. Everyone in this room probably has a secret sin, one that you're thinking about. Here's the thing about secret sins or secrets. Why do you have secrets? There's only uh, a couple of secrets I can think of that give life, like a birthday party, a surprise birthday party. Uh, when I proposed to my wife when she, two days before she was expecting it. That was life. That was a good secret. Other secrets? Big hint, if you have a secret, it's probably leading to something being dead in your life. It's probably what happens with secrets most of the time. Psalm 19, 12 says this, How can I know all the things lurking in my heart? Cleanse me from these hidden faults. Secret things just kill things. They don't produce life. Proverbs 28, 13, whoever conceals his transgressions will not prosper. Proverbs 14, 12, there is a way that seems right to a man, but in the end, it leads to death. It kills things. So that's a problem with secret sins in your life. So we have a solution for you. You will be convicted by the Holy Spirit. When you're building a crooked wall, brick by brick, the Holy Spirit, God's very spirit that dwells in you is going to tell you. This is what John 16, 8 says. And when he comes, the Holy Spirit, 
he will convict the world of its sin and of God's righteousness. You know what's so cool about that verse? You know what, usually what we focus on? He will convict the world of its sin. True thing. The Holy Spirit will tell you, Carlisle, crooked brick. But you know what else? The last part of that verse? And of God's righteousness. So not only does he convict me of crooked bricks, but he says, Carlisle, here's how you make the brick straight. And here's how you make the brick straight. He doesn't just condemn you of your sin and tell you and expose you of your sin. It says the Holy Spirit will convict you of righteousness. You'll be convictional about straight bricks in your life. That's what friendship, relationship with the Holy Spirit does. It provides right placement of bricks in your life and straight walls that replace crooked walls. Two more solutions. You will be forgiven by Jesus. 1 John 1, 9 says, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteous, unrighteousness. You can move beyond your crooked wall to a straight wall. And the last one, this is the accountability thing. You will be healed by your friends. In James, it says this, therefore confess your sins to one another and pray for one another so that you may be healed. Uh, the prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working. We can be a part of healing each other. Confess your sins so that you can be condemned, so you can be depressed, so you can put more crooked bricks on your wall. No, we get to heal each other by being accountable to each other. So that's where I want us to get to. That's the challenge. That's the action step today. Be accountable. Be accountable to people. If you are a, a female, be accountable to a female. If you're a male, be accountable to a male. Don't be isolated. Personal isolation leads to personal desolation. Just ask my friend. Ask him now, though. Don't kid yourself into thinking that you got this. Because in all actuality, you don't got this without Jesus and without your church community. So quit building crooked walls. Let's build straight walls together, not just for our sake. Let's build straight walls for our community. Let's build straight walls in our homes. Let's build straight walls in our hearts. Let's change us, and then let's change our community. Would you pray with me? Jesus, we thank you for this book, a book that we can so quickly forget about and not read, not be aware of. Thank you that through Amos, as you talk to him in those days, it applies to us in these days. Thank you that you put your heart in him, a heart for people who are unrighteous because he longed for them to be righteous. God, would you make us a church that is rooted in righteousness so that we care about just not the lostness of us, which is bad enough, but the lostness of people all around us, outside these walls that are killing things themselves. We just have this uncanny ability to not do the things that are in the best interest of you for our lives. Help us to have passion for ourselves that way, passion for our community that way. Help us to build straight walls so that our lives are ones that live and declare you, Jesus, and that are attractive to our community. In your name we pray, amen. So before we leave, uh, we hit on this. Take the card out. Here's some things I want to um, encourage you, challenge you. Uh, these cards are not for you. Same time, same place. They show up here on Easter. If you want to get baptized, let us know. We have a couple of people going for that. It's an outward de declaration of inward commitment to Jesus Christ. We're going to do it outside between services. If you haven't done that, um, by your own volition, which means if you got baptized as an infant and you haven't done it on your own, talk to me about that. It's a it's a great honor to do that, even if you were baptized as an infant for your parents. So we have all that going on, but here's the thing. I want to pray over this. So take this card and put it in your hand right now. We have stacks of them. If you want to take stacks and go door to door and put them, ring the doorbell and say, hey, come to church. Take them a plate of cookies with this invitation next week. Um, if you want to put them on the doorstep at five in the morning before anyone's up. Um, their, their ring will show you who you are. But go ahead and do it anyway and say, Jesus loves you. Come to church. Grab some of those. But I want you to be thinking and praying about who it is that you're going to give this to. So hold it up. I'm going to pray over you. Jesus, 
thank you for Easter. We thank you for what you did. We thank you for what you're doing. And we know, Jesus, that you came to make walls straight in the lives of our community. Enlarge our hearts, Jesus, for northern Peoria. Help us to be just bold enough to invite someone to take this card in our hands and give it to a person who may know you, who may not know you, so that they too can have a relationship with you, Jesus, that changes their life and makes straight walls. Jesus, use us as a church that reaches wider so people can walk deeper with you. It's in your name that we pray and it's in your name that we anticipate people that we invited coming to Easter. Jesus, amen. All right, as you go away, if you need some prayer, if you felt convicted about some things that, that we shared, um, stop back there. It, like I said last week, it does, it's not like a confessional booth. You don't have to get specific. But if you want to talk to someone, there's someone back there to pray with you. Um, as you go away, just focus on righteousness, not just for your sake, but for the sake of a community that needs straight walls. Be blessed as you go. Live in straight walls this week.